we are sitting actually at the bar. <laughs> um, sadly, it's not quite beer o'clock yet. It's oh, never no. too early. Yeah, right? Yes. Deal? Boing. Welcome to the Acquia podcast, Drupal technology, community, and business. Welcome to the Acquia podcast, Drupal technology, community, and business. There's a module for that? There, of course there is. Almost there. Uh, we're at Symphony Live in Berlin. This is... Dustin Whittle. Dustin, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us uh, what you do where. Yeah, my name's Dustin Whittle. I'm a developer evangelist for a company called App Dynamics. What we do is application performance monitoring for Java, PHP, .NET, Node.js, and mobile applications. So what we do is we figure out what healthy performance looks like, and when you deviate from that, we tell you exactly what went wrong with your application. So a ton of different companies use us in production to make sure that their users are having a great experience around the world. Sounds useful. It is very useful. Your talk today was was uh, pretty interesting. Um, could you tell us you had um, you had a sort of a working methodology where you said uh, Silex, which is the Symphony micro framework. When you're working with Silex, you add stuff. When you're working with Symphony, you take stuff away to get to your end result. Put a content management system like Drupal into that worldview. So I think a content management system like Drupal is one stack above. It's an application framework with a focus on content. So you already have all the features, but with Drupal, uh, you add modules. So I have a Drupal module if I want to use discuss comments, or I might have a Drupal module if I want to have polls. Well, what you're adding is functionality. So you're adding application functionality instead of adding um, code functionality. So instead of just having a translation service, I might actually have a way to manage translations across all my content properties. Or instead of turning on uh, user authentication or a security layer, you're enabling the Facebook module, which which provides uh, an entire application stack. And I think that's the, the, the biggest difference. And then taking advantage of the entire security layer that's already built into Right, so, with, so specifically for Silex, you turn on the security provider, but then you still have to manage all the security dependencies and configure that. When I enable the security component in Drupal or the, uh, an advanced security module, I just have to pass in maybe my Facebook app ID in secret and the rest is done for me. So I don't have to manually code all those little pieces. With a module, it's really focused on the application feature Feature instead of the technical feature. So you're adding Facebook login, you're not adding a security layer. So this is the Drupal so it's design more decision. Functional. Yeah. Right. So the Drupal design decision is empowering less technical users Precisely. to operate safely and productively and be able to communicate. And that's exactly right. And I think that's what makes the Drupal community so great is it's vibrant. There's a module for everything you can think of. Um, if I want polls, if I want discuss comments or any third-party provider, um, if I want Facebook login, Twitter login, et cetera, et cetera, these are all modules that are available. If I want to drop in a complete e-commerce shop, there are modules available that can do that. Even though it's simply a application framework or content management system, the community makes it much more than that. And I think that's what, uh, why it has such a large uh, audience and distribution around the world. Have you been following the Drupal 8 release cycle? Not as closely as I should, but I know that Drupal 8 is based on the Symphony 2 components like the HTTP Foundation, so I'm very excited to see it uh, making its way to a generally available release. Excellent. How did you discover open source? What's your first open source memory? Symphony 0.4, I want to th I think. So actually before that, um, it was really using PHP as a language itself and using extensions like the encrypt extension is the first thing I think I wrote like a blog post around it. Please don't go look at it. The code is horrendous, you know. But 10 years ago, I was doing a lot of consulting and everything, what I realized is that every project is pretty similar. So I just have to tweak a couple of pieces and hey, that's a new website. I thought, hey, why am I writing all this on my own? So I started to look at different frameworks and different tools that are available and I found Symphony. I was doing a lot of um, just general consulting and they're all the projects are the same. Hey, I need a way to log in and out. I need a way to manage this sort of data. And hey, I want to be able to do this in English and German. 
So I said, hey, with all these tools that are available, I should stop writing all of the stuff myself and maybe use one of them. And I discovered Symphony. I started building a bunch of projects on it. I started doing some consulting around it. And what I realized is it's way better if you take an open source project and only add the pieces that are special for your project instead of having to write everything from scratch. And that was sort of my, that was one of my earlier experiences in the open source world. So really the first was PHP. Just discovering PHP, it's an open source programming language, yet at the same time, there's all these modules that people were starting to add. So way back then there was no SSH module. Sarah came along and added a module to so you could do SSH stuff. Um, I think that was my first experience with the community. And then Symphony was just one level beyond that. And it was much more functional day to day because it made me more productive, which means I spent less time getting the same result, which means I spent half the time to earn just as much money. And I think that it was very valuable early on because I realized, hey, not only is there this coding benefit of leveraging um, much smarter people's work than mine, uh, but there's also a business benefit, which is, hey, I can be twice as productive uh, and earn twice as much money in half the time. And it's also much more uh, intellectually and emotionally satisfying when you get to solve the fun, hard, unique problem. Right rather than writing boilerplates. Nobody wants to write another login system. Like once you've written a blog system once, you don't want to do it 50 more times. Blogs aren't that special, all blogs have comments. You only want to write that logic once before you realize, hey, we should just never do that again. I also love the feeling of discovering a bug. Yes. And either uh, proposing or, or submitting a solution um, and then my problem is solved, but I know that um, thousands of other people, potentially, you know, hundreds of thousands of other people's problem is now solved and nobody has to solve that again. Yeah, I, I actually enjoy the same thing because the open source world really empowers you to make a contribution. It's not just enough that you complain, but you can actually contribute the solution. And I think that's um, really what's changed quite a bit because when I started, it was really hard to contribute. This was like pre GitHub. Everything was in subversion. In order to get access, you had to like get commit access, which was often a lengthy problem. Process. There was very little code review, so like the quality was a little um, ad hoc. Like you sort of never knew what you're getting from a community. Um, and nowadays, it's just so refined. So you know, there's it always feels good inside when you solve a problem for a lot of people. I tweeted that from your session today. Um, you said something like, "A pull request solving the problem is always better than a complaint about my thing not working." Right. I actually take that from Fabian Potentier, who always encourages people to send a pull request instead of filing an issue, which is a nice way of saying, put in a little work to get to the solution and we'll all be better off. So you touched on something interesting, and that is how the life of the open source developer has changed and become highly professionalized yeah. in the last decade. So as a preface. Drupal's been around 12, 13, 14 years, and we've got Drupal.org, which is our central repository system. It's now on Git, but it's its own thing. It used to be on CVS. Right. Um, but, you know, we had to invent every tool that we used. Exactly. Nowadays, you were saying that the job of the open source developer today is pretty much... It's glue. I think that, you know, when you look at developing applications today, you don't start with, okay, I'm using PHP, now let me write all of this functionality. When I look, when I work with a client or I'm um, walking into a new project, I like to figure out like, what are the tools I'm gonna need to solve this problem? So hey, you have functionality like I want a shopping cart and I need a way to manage uh, content. So to me, I look at that and I say, hey, we should use this e-commerce system and, this, and we should combine that with Drupal. And really what the open source developer does is just takes all these tools and does the integration glue and focuses just on the special piece of your application, not on all the boilerplate. And I think that's really the evolution because if you go back 10 years ago, um, using open source in a commercial environment is extremely hard to do. Today it's commonplace. Today they say it's the reverse. Hey, you want to build this? Well, why should we build it? Is there something we can use from the open source community instead? Uh, and I think that the, the dialogue's completely changed. And I think what that means is that developers can be um, way more productive because you're building on the shoulders of giants. Like why solve all those problems when you can leverage an open source community? An open source community is hundreds of thousands of developers that you're not paying to work on features that you benefit from. So why would you not want to leverage that? And I think that's now how developers work. It's, hey, I'm gonna use this templating layer, I'm gonna use this e-commerce package, 
page. I'm going to glue it all together, and here's a site that would have previously taken two years to develop. I developed it in a week because I'm using all these tools. Right, and I can choose the best of breed of this, and I can choose the one that I know how to use best here. Precisely. And my friend's written this new thing that we're going to test by rolling it into this project, um, and everybody's happy, and the whole stack gets a tiny bit better every time someone rolls out a new project. Yeah, I think that's exactly it, because not only are you leveraging uh, tools to make you more productive, but you may encounter an issue, and you're going to file it issue, and hopefully you send a pull request and you solve it not only for you, but for the entire community. And the whole tool set matures because of that. And that's the mentality that I think has really changed. Um, and I'm all for it because most of my job is doing, you know, gluing together components and making something shiny for people. So in the age of the, the, the GitHub developer, yeah. right? Talk about the talk about the PHP renaissance that's going on. So I think GitHub as a developer platform has really just enabled collaboration in an unprecedented way over the last five or six years. I mean, if you look at the early projects like Ruby on Rails moving there, if you look at PHP is now hosted on GitHub, um, every major company that supports that ecosystem hosts their code there. So it makes it very easy to collaborate on every project. So it's not just about, can I contribute my fix to PHP, but PHP and Symfony and Zen Framework and all these other communities live in the same place and that place is GitHub. Now, PHP today is very different than PHP was 10 years ago. One, you have commercial sponsors. So in the early days, uh, Yahoo hired a lot of the PHP core engineers. Um, Etsy has now contributed a bunch of tools. Uh, Facebook, I think, now is leading the way with Hack and HHVM. And I think that the, that's what's come a long way, is the commercial entities around this are really using an open source mentality. Now, the early days were, hey, PHP sponsors, uh, sorry, Yahoo sponsors PHP. PHP gets better because Yahoo has some business need for an extension. Open source developers write that. It gets contributed to the community. Now everyone can use it. I think Facebook is solving a different problem, which is making um, PHP as a platform more scalable for their needs. And I think only companies like uh, Facebook or of Facebook scale can afford to hire specialized teams. So you have the Hack and HHVM team, which some of them previously worked at Yahoo on PHP Core. They all come, a lot of them come from the PHP Core community. Um, and I think that's really what's changing. And so now you have PHP 7, you have HHVM, um, you have uh, sort of the official PHP. And then Wait, all the PHP 7 is PHP NG, right? Correct. Okay. I believe. Or maybe it's PHP 6. Pretty sure it's PHP 7. But it's PHP 7, which was PHP NG. And the question is, what's going to win out in the long term? So you have HHVM, which supports the hack language, which is syntactically compatible with PHP in a lot of ways. It's not perfect, but for the most part. Then you have PHP 7. So the problem with making um, gigantic changes in PHP 7 is how do you support 10 years worth of developers? Right and developers' projects, how do you make sure you don't break things for every Drupal developer that's out there, every company running on that? Um, whereas when you're starting with something new, you can make large changes relatively easy. So HHVM is, uh, is a completely new VM with a JIT. These are changes that you can't just make in PHP that easily. Um, some syntax stuff has, got, has changed a little bit, some have improved. Some of this they, they can contribute back, some of it they can't. Um, that's the hard part moving forward. It's like, how do you fundamentally change a language or improve the way uh, a language's, language runtime works uh, without breaking backwards compatibility for everyone else? When you're someone like PHP, PHP has this massive community. Drupal, every, every major PHP project would break if they just implemented some of those changes. Facebook has the freedom to do that, and you can opt into it. So you have not only um, Facebook making advanced changes in PHP, that are uh, really it's HHVM, um, and making fundamental improvements in how you process that. So they have a VM, and the VM has a JIT, and you have performance benefits because of that. Um, but more importantly, they're taking an open source approach, more so than I think PHP Core has in the past, because they're focusing commercial developers on an open source problem. So they're, prob they're solving the problem for themselves selfishly. Like, how can they save money in data center costs by making the application faster and more scalable by converting PHP first to C++ and now just rewriting it so PHP or hack is much faster? Um, and then, but more importantly, how do you make that available for other companies? So uh, you have companies like Baidu running completely on HHVM or mostly on HHVM. Um, you have large open source projects where they're making sure that they're compatible with HHVM. A lot of that effort comes from Facebook's approach of this open source mentality of, okay, not only do we need HHVM um, to support all these extensions and frameworks to get wide adoption, uh, but that takes a lot more additional time. When HHVM was er released early on, they only focused on the features that Facebook 
now they've invested in the community, which means you'll get that wider adoption. So at some point in the future, the question is, do people proceed down the HHVM route, or do they go down the PHP setup route? Or, or, or do, do those come together somehow? at some point? So the convergence is much more difficult. Again, with the backwards compatibility, how do you converge to fundamentally different approaches? So I think these are uh, all questions that people much smarter than myself uh, will be dealing with in the future. And I think uh, the good thing about it is oftentimes the people working on HHVM are people who've contributed to PHP. So you have people like uh, Sarah Goldman who understand both sides of that equation. Um, plus you have an endless amount of money with Facebook as a corporate sponsor, <laughs> almost. Um, and you have the goodwill of an open source community who wants to evolve but finds it difficult to do so. So I think at some point um, everyone will come together and figure out the best path forward. And I think there's already that um, an attitude of collaboration, right? And I think that's mostly what's needed. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm really keen to see what happens to PHP in the next couple of years. I think it's going to be, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be exciting. And I think um, the performance and scalability issues that are being addressed here are going to, we're going to benefit from whatever solutions emerge from that. Absolutely. Well, but, PHP 7 is already benefiting by some of the performance events. Now, it's a different approach, but it fundamentally improves performance by solving the same problems. Right. And at the same time, there's so much work going on around interoperability. Um, PSR Composer, Precisely. making it entirely possible for Drupal to integrate Symfony stuff and, and, and external libraries and, you know, easy publish to be built on a Symfony stack and, you know, everybody's sharing all this stuff and, and it's all, it's all, the boundaries are disappearing a little bit and everyone's, yeah. everyone's, you know, uh, hobby horse, right? My favorite system, your favorite system. Every, everyone seems to be benefiting. From well, it and now. what you actually see is a a change in the attitude of like, hey, if I didn't write it, it can't be a part of my framework. Where, like, if you take a look at Fig, um, many of the PHP frameworks now rely on the same sort of subsystems underneath. So Drupal's using Symfony components, um, Silex uses Symfony components, Easy CMS uses Symfony components. All these massive platforms are starting to use like, hey, maybe we don't need to rewrite how we handle the HTTP protocol. If there's a foundation for that that we can just drop in, hey, we all benefit by using the same system. And more importantly, we can all collaborate on fixing the same problems. Uh, and I think that that attitude just didn't exist uh, eight years ago. If you look at like even the original version of Symfony, which was based on Mojave, um, if you uh, if you look at uh, Zen Framework One, like all of the all of the stuff is built like uh, from scratch to solve a very specific problem. And nowadays they think a little bit outside of that and say, hey, what tools can we reuse and build on top of this? I think that attitude's uh, what enables the rest. Sure, and you look at you look at a project like Drupal that was a little bit um, isolated, very, very, very idiomatic um, through the Drupal Seven release. Yep. Um, we had uh, a very we had very much the the not invented here syndrome, mm -hmm. uh, right? And uh, Angie Byron, I think, encapsulated the new attitude, which is Pi, which is proudly invented elsewhere. <laughs> right. So I love to see that. I think it's it's really great time to be in PHP. Yeah. Thank you so much. For Thanks taking for the time me. to talk about this stuff. It's been really fun. It's great to meet you. Likewise. Can you hear me perfectly? I think you can. Balloons and happy faces, folks. That's what we're here for.